You've probably seen the headlines about NASA calling out SpaceX for moving too slowly on Starship, and even Musk firing back at NASA officials in public. But while all that noise was happening, SpaceX quietly shifted into a completely different gear. What they're doing right now is on a scale we haven't seen before, and it might be the update that finally silences all the criticism. We're going to break down everything in this video and show you exactly how SpaceX is preparing for the next stage of Starship. Before we dive in, make sure to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any of our future updates. Since NASA publicly accused SpaceX of moving too slowly, the company reacted immediately. Literally, the moment Starship Flight 11 ended, SpaceX moved straight into teardown mode at Pad 1. Crews were on-site cutting steel, removing plumbing, and stripping hardware within hours. The reason is simple. Starship Phi-2 and Starship Phi-3 are not small incremental upgrades. They're completely different machines. V-2 stands around 121 meters tall, with a total thrust of roughly 7,600 tons at liftoff. V-3 is much more powerful. With the new Raptor 3 engines, Liftoff thrust jumps to almost 10,000 tons, and the vehicle becomes heavier, taller, and far more demanding on the pad infrastructure. The exhaust temperature alone during ignition can reach levels that destroy steel surfaces within seconds. No launch mount built for V2 could survive repeated V3 launches. This is why SpaceX didn't just reinforce Pad 1. They removed the V-2 era strainers because the V-3 fueling system needs 5,500 to 6,000 tons of propellant per hour, way beyond what the old setup was ever designed to handle. The orbital launch mount is being cut open piece by piece and all internal lines exposed so they can replace everything with a V-3-grade layout. The new pad will also include a 30-meter-long, 10-meter-deep flame trench, far larger than anything SpaceX has previously built. This trench is necessary to redirect the plasma and shockwave from 33 Raptor 3 engines so that the pad, the pipes, and the booster quick disconnect don't get torn apart by acoustic energy. On top of that, SpaceX is modifying Mekazilla. The chopstick arms at Pad 1 are being shortened from around 20 meters to about 18. Shorter arms reduce bending during high winds and improve catching precision. SpaceX already installed this design at Pad 2 and LC-39A, so they're standardizing the system across all launch sites. Meanwhile, Pad 2 is being prepared as the main V3 launch pad. Unlike Pad 1, Pad 2 has two booster quick disconnects, allowing the V-3 booster to be fueled much faster. SpaceX has already run multiple long-duration cryogenic tests on both disconnects to make sure they can detach cleanly while holding higher pressures. Pad 2 also has a more advanced deluge system and an upgraded subcooling setup. The venting seen in recent tests confirms that SpaceX is validating a full-stack V-3 fueling timeline. And while the pads are being rebuilt outside, production is scaling inside. The new Gigabay, the 116-meter-tall factory, is rising faster than any previous Starship building. Steel columns for multiple floors are already up, and the frame for Crane Tower 4 is nearly finished. This facility will support high-rate V3 manufacturing, with automated welding lines, heavier assembly floors, and internal crane bridges designed for lifting full rings and thrust domes. SpaceX is also preparing a new Raptor 3 production wing at Starbase. Raptor 3 is simpler, hotter burning, more powerful, and easier to mass produce than Raptor 2. Musk said the long-term goal is to reach 200 to 250 Raptor engines per year, which is essential because each Starship stack needs 39 engines. While SpaceX is rebuilding the tower and tearing apart the old launch mount, there's another option they've been seriously considering. And it sounds crazy at first. Landing Starship on a giant drone ship out at sea, just like the Falcon 9 boosters. And surprisingly, the reasoning behind it actually makes perfect sense. Right now, losing a Starship during testing is expensive, but it's nowhere near as catastrophic as losing an entire launch pad. A full Starship stack today is estimated anywhere between 50 to over $100 million, depending on the configuration. It's a lot, but it's still something SpaceX can replace quickly, especially once Gigabay starts pushing out vehicles at a high rate. 
On the other hand, destroying a launch pad, even partially, is a completely different kind of problem. Rebuilding all that can take months and cost in the hundreds of millions. And every day the pad is down, SpaceX loses testing time and launch opportunities. That's the kind of damage that freezes the entire program. This is why landing Starship at sea is appealing. If something goes wrong during landing, the vehicle is lost, sure, but the pad is safe. SpaceX already deals with ocean recovery for Falcon 9, so shifting Starship landing attempts offshore isn't as far-fetched as it sounds. Musk even said publicly that during early testing, losing vehicles is expected, but losing a pad is something they absolutely cannot afford. If a Starship explodes on the pad, everything stops. If it explodes out at sea, operations continue and the next booster rolls out soon after. Of course, SpaceX can't just take the same drone ships they use for Falcon 9 and drop Starship onto them. Falcon 9 is about 70 meters tall and produces around 760 tons of thrust at liftoff. Starship, when fully stacked with the Super Heavy booster, stands roughly 121 meters tall and produces close to 10,000 tons of thrust with the Raptor 3 engines. The scale difference is so massive that a Falcon 9 drone ship would look like a toy next to Starship. For a sea landing to work, the platform would need to be dramatically larger to handle the booster's enormous footprint and stable enough to absorb the landing forces. Engineers estimate that a Starship-capable drone ship might have to be several times bigger than the current Falcon 9 ships, possibly the size of a small offshore oil rig or a heavily reinforced barge fitted with giant stabilizers. Something like that could easily cost tens of millions to build or convert. It might sound impossible, but think about how impossible it seemed 20 years ago to land a rocket and fly it again. Back then, Every rocket was expected to burn up or crash into the ocean, and anyone talking about reusing boosters was treated like they were living in a fantasy. Today, that fantasy is happening almost twice every week with Falcon 9. Right now, Falcon 9 has flown well over 500 missions, and the success rate is basically near perfect. They've reused boosters more than anyone ever imagined possible, with some of them flying 10 times or more while still performing reliably. A few years ago, even one reuse was a big headline. Now it's normal, it's predictable, and it barely makes news anymore because SpaceX made it feel routine. SpaceX launched over 100 Falcon rockets in a single year, something no other space company or agency has ever come close to. And the most impressive part is how consistent those landings have become. They're not landing boosters once in a while. They're doing it almost every time, whether it's on land or on a drone ship in the middle of the ocean. And the real magic is the cost. A Falcon 9 launch today is dramatically cheaper than anything else in its class. NASA once paid over $80 million per seat to fly astronauts on Russian Soyuz rockets. When SpaceX came in with Crew Dragon, the cost per seat reportedly dropped to around $55 million. Still a lot of money, but tens of millions cheaper than the old options. And that's just the crew program. A single launch sits around the $67 million range today. But because the booster is reused and the turnaround costs are so low, analysts estimate that the actual operational cost to SpaceX, the real cost of flying, is far lower. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.